isn't it incredible how the complete mood, the view and the perception of a football club and players can be completely flipped based on winning some games of football? It's a good feeling, isn't it, boys? And it is one which we have missed for quite a long time and is a feeling that hopefully, you would imagine, we're going to be experiencing a lot more than what we did in the last campaign. Welcome to the debrief every single game. I'll be here on the Turfcast channel, kind of a day or so after the full-time whistle, kind of going through the game and kind of what happened around it. And because of how much information has happened since... And prior to it, there's quite a lot to go through here. So, let's get the obvious done here. Luton Town 1, Burnley 4. A statement win for the first game under Scott Parker's tenure. A lot of nerves, a lot of tension, that, that and, and a lot of excitement. Something that sends us back to that first game under Vincent Company with that 1-0 win away at Huddersfield Town with the complete uncertainty of how exactly are we going to fare as many of these players we deemed were here because of Vincent Company, and would they be as committed, would they be ha as, as composed as what they used to look like two seasons ago? Well, as we've just seen, it's hard to judge exactly were we really good at performing our game plan, or were Luton just simply really poor? Now, let's not beat on the bush here. Luton Town, despite being a Premier League team last year, right now are a bit in the mess because they've got a ton of injuries, especially in their back line. A lot of them. They were playing Joseph Johnson and Rule Walters, who are both like 18, 19 years old. And I think with both of those two, is I believe their first start of senior football in any competitive setting. Uh, you know, they just play academy games. So they're in a real bad situation. However, attacking-wise, it's still a very good attack. Charlton, uh, Carlton Morris, Taif Chong, Adebayo, Ogbene, Doherty, it's a still a very good attack, which I feel like we dealt with incredibly. We forced them out wide and forced them simply to throw balls into the box, which we are more than happy to deal with. Even under... A Vincent Company team, we always feel like physicality was always our weak point, especially in set pieces. Dara O'Shea is like a, a Ben Me compared to the fact that he doesn't look like he should be that great in the air because he doesn't look like he's that tall, but he just gets his head onto everything. He's brave, he's tenacious, and he gets his body in the way of the ball and his body in the line, and he did that time and time again defensively and, of course, scoring the third goal. And a Stevie as well, that, that also cannot be forgotten. What a statement win it was, because it was, it was different to how we used to play. We didn't have that much possession under Vincent Company. That was our main thing. However, we were more than happy to simply just let Luton have the ball. I think Luton Town, they knew, would have their game plan to completely press us in man-on-man -man situations. They felt like we were going to play similar to how we played back in Premier League. And that is what I feel like completely caught them out and what gave us the win. Six minutes in, that ball over the top by Lucas Perez. And when it felt like we had to go long, we did. And that's where two of our goals came from in that first half. And technically, the fourth goal came from us also doing something similar, but completely unorthodox with Lyle Foster with one of the best assists you may now see all season. Later in the game, I mean, the 80th minute, by the way, he's played the full 90 almost, and he's got the pace to make a 60, 70-yard dash, and he almost lost the ball as well. He dropped deep to receive the ball under pressure. He almost lost it, but recovered, and then turned his man and then drove 60 yards to get the perfect pass, perfect weight, perfect time to Vitinho that smashed it in off the post for that fourth goal. And when you look at that game, it if you look at it, in terms of tactically, it looked like a masterclass. Luton Town did not know how we were going to prepare, as it was that first game, and it felt like with the information that they had, Scott Parker typically plays a possession style of football, and that was not the case. We simply didn't care, and we wanted to hit them on the break and hit them over the top, over the high line, and that is what happened, and we made it pay. 
Now, of course, is this an indicator of how we'll play all year? Probably not, because most teams will not be like Luton. They will try to press us high and to try to put us under pressure. Most teams won't. Most teams may play like how Cardiff will this weekend, which they will simply drop deep, go on a low block, and try to suffocate us, or sorry, to try to frustrate us, and say to us, we're in our positions, we're set up, try to break us down, which is exactly how we experienced the vast majority of our last championship campaign. So this weekend against Cardiff will probably be much more of an indicator of how we're going to play this season. So most teams may not play like how Luton plays. On the teams that may is the likes of a Leeds, maybe the likes of a maybe Sheffield United, but there's not many teams that will actually try to go pound for pound against us. So this weekend will be a lot more of an indication of what to experience and what to expect for this campaign. But you cannot take away what a fantastic result that was and a statement win it was. Because I would have happily, probably same as you, took a point every day of the week. Luton Town is definitely top three hardest away grounds in the league. And to go there for the first game of the season with a complete new manager, complete new system in theory, there were so many... Uh, worlds where that could have gone wrong for us and we could have made a mistake at the back or whatever and we would have been punished. That didn't happen. We conceded due to them inevitably after just throwing in so many crosses into the box, hoping for the best. One of them landed and it fell in the path of Chong, which unfortunately led to um, a goal which we didn't keep a clean sheet, unfortunately. Now, in terms of transfers, Sander Berg, of course, was not in the lineup or even on the bench which may spring a lot of concerns, especially because he wasn't even there for the Cadiz game. He wasn't even playing, didn't play a single minute. Now, of course, you may say that could make sense. However, Trafford as well didn't play any minutes either against Cadiz, and he did indeed start. Now, it has come out that, according to Scott Parker, that people may refuse to believe, but he did pick up a bit of a, a quad uh, strain over in Spain prior to that Cadiz game that led to him having a bit of time out. It won't be long, it's only minor as far as Scott Park is concerned. However, he will be out for maybe two weeks or so. They're going to try to nurse it and bring him back in a good time period. However, there is no doubt that there is still negotiations and interest into Sanderberg from the likes of Manchester United. And as far as we're concerned, that is still a possibility. However, it does look like it is more likely that they will be priced out for around £30 million, which I think, if you look at what we've just seen with a Cullen and Brownhill midfield, if we were to get a £30 million bid for Sander Berg, would you take it? For me personally, I, 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 I wouldn't complain if we did, because I think... We don't particularly need him for the championship to, to get promoted. However, we definitely would need him for the Premier League. So in terms of do we need him to get up, I don't think we do. However, for the next season, we would need a player like Sanderberg. So I absolutely would keep him. However, if we were to get 25, 30 million for him, I would not complain as long as, as, long as it's not below 20 as far as I'm concerned. However, another transfer rumour that's come out prior and has unfortunately accelerated a little bit more and that's Dara O'Shea. Dara O'Shea, it appears, could be potentially going to Brentford. Now again, it's not completely confirmed but there is still negotiations that how much we may receive is still a bit in the air but I believe it is around the realm of around the 18, 20 million pounds. And as a general rule of form, Pretty much any of our players, especially the kind of younger ones, so like Zeki M. Dooney, Wilson Oldebert, they're usually always around the 25 to 30 million pound price range. So as a rule of thumb, that's kind of where we value the vast majority of our players. Because Del Oshie is a little bit older, he's probably not got the same value compared to the 19-year-old wonder kids that we have in terms of Oldebert or Collie Oshaw or M. Dooney, you know. So that's kind of why his valuation is maybe a little bit lower. And also defenders are typically never rated as highly as attackers. In the same reason why I think Nick Pope went for about £12 million or so. You, you know, like it is just one of them. So if you do lose if you do lose O'Shea, 
it would be a bit of a miss because clearly he's a fantastic player for this level. However, you cannot ignore the fact that we are simply very prepared for this season at centre-backs. We've still got Esteve, we've still got Jordan Bayer, we've still got Ekdal, we've still got uh, McNally or Aldekiel or Delcroix. Now, you may say they're not as good as Olshay, which is fair enough. However, we've still got a lot of options there and we're probably still bringing a centre-back in if one does leave. Could be the likes of John Egan from Sheffield United that had a big injury, so it may be a bit of a risk. Or the likes of, a, I believe, the um, Joel Wall from Nottingham Forest is also a link as well. So if O'Shea does go, it'd be the likes of a Joel Wall or John Egan that may replace them. So it won't be if he leaves, we'll stick with what we have because clearly Bayer a few others may have some injury issues that we may not be able to completely rely on them for a full campaign. Going into the rest of the group, it doesn't look like we really are too interested in bringing in any more players. It's only a case of if one leaves, we may bring in another one. Another weird like, <laughs> de de development that I did not expect to see is Valt Verkost. Well, I was just about to enter my training session and I looked at my phone and I saw the, the rumor that Valt Verkost was in the squad. Now, I personally laughed because I simply did not believe it. I don't even think he's even available at training for the entirety of preseason. So I thought, well, simply that cannot be the case. If he's not even at preseason, then how can he be starting in the first game of the season, or at least be in, be in the squad? But long behold, he was, which stunned me. And I've also lost a tenner because I bet to a, a, a Twitter user on a, a Burnley fan saying, if he somehow plays a single minute in the championship, I'll give you a tenner. Well, cheers, Scott Parker, mate. I'm now £10 less well off as I used to be. Could this maybe be the sign of a redemption arc for Valt Vegost? Personally, I'll be stunned. But I'm kind of happy if he gets some kind of send-off. And from what I saw from the fans in the away end, it looked like he was received quite well. And that, that makes me quite happy. Because the, the entire kind of saga of Valt Vegost, I still feel like there's a great player there. Clearly, there is an idea that he is a bit maybe egotistical or maybe he doesn't want to be here or maybe he thinks he's too good for the club or too big, too good for this level. And yes, Val Vegas is definitely too good for the championship, in my opinion. You may think he's a donkey or whatever, but I personally think he's a good player. I just think that there's definitely parts of his personality that may rub the wrong way with people, which I get completely. But I think if we can have him this season, that is beyond like, incredibly, like, uh, the clinical. If we have Val Vegos in the championship, then this would be an, a, a stupidly insane campaign, in my opinion, because he offers something completely different to what we already have. And in terms of the lineup, by the way, I mean, Lyle Foster, I want to give a massive shout out to him. Completely incredible performance, like so many players. Lucas Perez as well, the entire backline. Vitinho. When I saw Vitinho on the right hand side uh, as a right winger, I was a little bit concerned, and he was kind of as a right wing back out of possession, so he did kind of drop deep to help out kind of Roberts there. And I, I think that was why he played there ahead of, let's say, a Zeruri or a Benson. Benson not getting any minutes is maybe a bit of a concern. However, maybe he wasn't needed because we were already so far ahead. But I would have liked to see him. But Vitinho absolutely... He does, it, it does surprise me more and more because I don't think he's technically a better player than Zeruri or Benson. But he's got that energy. He's got that drive. He's got that, he's got that element to him that you just can't help but love because you always know that he gives us all. And even though he may not be the most composed or makes the right decision all the time, you can't help but love his character and his enthusiasm to keep going. And that's why so many people love Vitinho so much. And the thing is that kind of scares me, and it scares me because it makes me think of the possibility of this season. We just went to Luton Town away which will be up there, by the way. I know right now they may not be completely there because they're missing some players and injuries, but they will be in the top six this season, or around that area. They'll be up there. And we just made it look easy. And we were missing Amdouni, we were missing Bayer, we were missing Trezor, we were missing Benson, we were missing... Um, who else was even missing that team that may have also started? I mean, Zaruri was came off the bench, but like, there's so many players there that were even the Berg. There was no Sander Berg. Like, so many players that you would think could also be in the starting eleven, or at least on the bench, weren't even there. 
and we looked comfortable. Now, of course, I will also say that this weekend against Cardiff may be a large indicator of what is to come this season. When you play a team that will expect to completely frustrate you and just defend in two banks of four and say to you, try your best, do your worst. And if we go through this weekend against Cardiff and we beat them again, like 3-0, convincingly, 3-1 or whatever, then I will get quite excited. And it's hard not to. So that's kind of my view on the game, my kind of review, my kind of debrief. It would be a shame if the likes of O'Shea does depart. However, because of how many players we have, I believe right now we've got, I want to say we've got like 34, 35 players in our current senior squad. However, because um, under-21s are excluded from that, I think we've got right now six players that's over the limit or five players over the limit. So you, you should expect some outgoings in the next couple of days. And I think that's fine because I think you kind of have to ask what is still rather large. We've got a lot of depth and let's hope that the if we do sell a big player like a Sanderberg or an O'Shea, they get our money's worth. And if they do go, if it is O'Shea or Sanderberg, I still wouldn't even be, I wouldn't complain much because I think we are still so prepared that I think we'll be fine either way as long as we get a good valuation for them and we can also replace them with a player that I think is also probably good enough for the league anyway. So, Comment down below your thoughts, but it is very hard to not be excited of what may happen this season. And by the way, James Trafford, very happy to see the love that he got as well. After what happened last year, he was kind of seen as a bit of a scapegoat, and I get why, and, I, 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 and even I fell victim to that as well, mainly because I just feel like Vincent Company just did not manage him well at all, and he, it, it, it made a a sense that he was part of the reason, part of the blame why we went down. And I think that was really unfair. And it, it, that's on company for me for just keep on forcing him and forcing him when we had Murich behind him that made the fans feel a certain way about him. And clearly Trafford feels that way too in terms that he feels like he's been treated un, unfair by not only company, but maybe by the fans as well. And it was great to see him in that fourth goal run across the length of the pitch and celebrate with the players. And at the end, he got a good send-off too, just like Felt Vergost. So I'm happy to see Trafford get his flowers too. So I hope you guys did enjoy this little debrief. Uh, I may try and do this as like a live stream potentially um, after the Cardiff game as well. And I believe tonight, so you'll see this probably on Wednesday. So it'd be already done, but we'll be doing the full-time show as well. So yeah, it's very exciting times. I mean, kind of already knew that it could be like this, but you never wanted to believe it. Well, let's talk after that Blackburn game and we'll see what we believe in then. But I think it could be good things. So yeah, enjoy your day. See ya.